wool's almost become a bit of a, a dare I say, a byproduct for a lot of people because there's just no money in it. I do have every confidence that it will come back. It's just such a good product, it really is. I'm Michael Northcote and I would be the uh, fourth generation farming here at Highfield. I believe it is probably the biggest uh, still on use wooden wool shed in New Zealand. It was 24 stands, we currently only use four to four or five. What are you shearing today? So it, uh, these are just some trading hoggets that we have. So this is a fine wool, I mean your merino wool is finer. There's still, there's still money in them Michael? Very much so, in the, in the finer wool there is. Our main ewe flock here is Romney's, but it cost us $9.30 per sheep to shear them with a cover comb, and we would probably end up getting about $8 to $9 worth of wool, the coarse wool, yeah. Wow. So, wool accounts for probably about 12% of our total farm income, whereas sheep totally uh, they, they account for about 78% of our total income. So you can see how much the meat value of the sheep is as opposed to the wool value. And like some people are even going to the, these this Wiltshires and Dorpers. There's a breed of sheep now that sheds its own wool. That's how insignificant it is to a lot of people. It's just a, it's just a nuisance, you know, you've got to pay these shearers, you've got to dag the sheep, crutch the sheep, it's quite a cost. We will stick with it though. I've got, I come from a family that's very passionate about wool. You know, it, it's a hell of a good product and it's totally under, undervalued, to be honest. It's been in my blood for four to five generations and probably before that because, because uh, our, our family was in the sheep and wool industry in Scotland. My great-grandparents came out here in the 1870s. They had uh, about three possessions. They had a, a jar of whiskey and a, uh, a jar of honey, and which were both empty on arrival apparently, <laughs> and, and, and a sheepdog. Maybe the sheepdog got the whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was very, uh, very up and down. There was various different depressions and recessions and that sort of thing, right through from uh, the, the early 1900s, right through till, till after the Second World War. And the 1950s and that sort of thing was when, uh, when the wool took off. There are about 714 million sheep in the world. 40 million of them are in New Zealand. The Korean War uh, uh, caused the, the market to, uh, the wool market to boom because the Korean War was taking place in very cold climate and the American forces required a lot of wool for uniforms. They go out to the paddocks once more to grow next year's crop. Wool, so important to New Zealand's prosperity and to the warmth of the world. My uncle, when he was at Flock Hill, and he, 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 he went there in about 1950, I think it was, when he went there. And at one stage during the 50s, he, he was the biggest single taxpayer in Canterbury for three years in a row. Beauty remains in the limelight as a packed house is treated to the 1965 Wool Award Fashion Parade. The shorn sheep may shiver, but for the young sophisticate, there's the new look in winter warmth. A bold black and white check. After the glory days of the 50s and the 60s, uh, there was a boom in synthetic production. And that material has been used everywhere, from flooring through to fabrics and in clothing, and really has dominated what we wear around the world. Vinylite upholstery complements every colour in the spectrum. I think around seven, eight years ago, we found a real tipping point where people are demanding not just uh, natural fibres, but ethically sourced fibres. And wool's just a, a magnificent natural fibre. There's an increasing demand and inquiry for wool carpet. We were always wool, and then synthetics came along. We decided to give it a shot, and we then realised over time that consumers were moving towards more natural fibres again, and so we've gone 100% natural. 
This is a fully compostable rug. It's 100% um, natural and is able to be returned to the earth at the end of its life. The beauty of natural fibre, like wool. The synthetic carpet that we made doesn't go away. It just ends up in landfill and you know that, that is a problem. Wool's the best fibre for carpet. It's, it's just as simple as that. For fire retardancy, wool is superior. For odour resistance, wool is superior. For warmth, wool is superior. For performance, wool is superior. So, you know, it's got, it's an amazing package. What's superior about plastic? It's cheap. <laughs> that is it. You know, New Zealand is the second largest producer of strong wool in the world. You know, governments are sort of trying to go towards renewable energy. Synthetic carpet is made from a byproduct of a non-renewable energy resource which is being legislated against aggressively all around the world. So when you don't have the byproduct of the energy resource, you don't have a carpet to produce because you don't have any fiber. It's got to be a future. Has to be a future. Approximately 40% of strong wool that's produced or farmed is used for carpet. So if we do well, we expect the farmers will begin to do well again as well. You know, uh, the strong wool used to be the golden fleece and, you know, we'd love to see those days return again. Merino traditionally is a, a much finer fibre measured in a millionth of a metre, which is called a micron. And you can see the crimp and the white bright colour in it, which makes it so great for apparel. The softness of the fibre means when it's next to skin, you have less prickles. Strong wool is more coarse than merino, and it's noticeably thicker when you feel it, which makes it stronger and more resilient for upholstery and carpets. Um, our merino growers are really struggling during that time, and they decided they wanted to do something different. Uh, they were dis disconnected from where the wool was going, it was going to auction, they didn't know who or, or what they were producing it for, and they, they needed to be reinvigorated to find a passion, to find a connection, and they decided as an industry to come together and try something different, and that was the birth of the New Zealand Merino Company. Well, our goal is to get people together, open up the supply chain, get brands working with growers, and actually tell some of the romance of the story of, of New Zealand farming. Most of our wool is um, contracted to icebreaker, so, so it's all made into icebreaker clothing. So we've got an icebreaker contract, um, which is a 10-year contract, so we know what we're going to get um, from year to year. It does vary a wee bit, but it gives us a bit of certainty about what we're going to get each year as well. It's not easy, but you can still make a dollar out of it. It's been really exciting over the last few years, looking at new products and new categories and, and trying to find new uses for wool. And that's what's been really exciting about working with Logan and coming up with Sheer Edge. I thought to myself, you know, what can wool be used for? And one prevailing thing that kept coming through was plastic. You know, how can we replace fiberglass or fibre in plastic? Uh, so the way I started was pretty humble beginnings. Went to the warehouse and brought a, um, a toasty machine, very similar to this one. Um, brought a whole case of PLA made from cornstarch. It's like a bioplastic. So I melted that down with wool, chopped up and made a sheet of material. It looked like a piece of naan bread. I'm not going to lie to you, it was pretty rough. It looked strong and rigid and I thought, wow, we're actually onto something here. Maybe, maybe there is potential for this to work. So we partnered with a company in Hamilton called Maisie Group, and they make these pellets at scale for us with our wool in them. Um, and this means that we can produce, you know, tons and tons of material that can produce thousands of products. This by far is one of my favorites, which is the world's first woolen kayak. Um, this is 30% wool by content. Uh, this kayak is lighter because of the wool. It's stiffer because of the wool. Um, and it's also better for the environment and can be recycled. The knife is our first product though. The wool handle has about as much wool as we can physically put in it. <laughs> so we're sitting at more like 70% wool. The white from the handle is made from the colour of the wool. 
<laughs> this is a cooler bin, a big cooler bin. <laughs> so this is a wool, woolen cooler bin. You can definitely see the wool patterns coming through here. Again, one of the worst environmental products on the planet are cooler bins. We have a beautiful biodegradable, um, bio-sourced insulation um, and a wool material outer from Shearage. I think our goal is to impact the entire wool industry. And we're going to do that by taking the waste and low value wool and deriving value for the farmers for it. What's been really important is trying to get wool where it's not. These are uh, wool insulation panels. Uh, noise pollution in commercial environments is a, a really challenging issue. So this is a great way for us to use a natural product. Likewise, uh, indoor woolen shoes. Tremendous growth in that space. This is strong. So we're seeing the excitement of, of what new materials can bring. This is wool broken down and coloured. So in effect, we've created a pigment out of wool. Pigments go into just about every sector in the world. Think inkjet printing, colours on car seats. There's a whole range of industrial applications as well as cosmetics and pigments that we're looking to use. Using wool, which is 100% biodegradable, goes really well against your skin, as the substrate as opposed to a petrochemical or a synthetic um, is a really compelling product for the cosmetics industry. We have significant international interest for some, from some really big companies overseas. The intent is to use a lot of wool. Strong Wool is making a comeback and we're determined to make a, a solid future for wool. So we need to, for our growers to be able to continue to farm. Wool.